Do you ever wonder how professors actually create exams? That's what the focus of today's video is going to be about. I'm going to run through an actual exam that I made in 2014 for a course that I taught. And you notice there's a bunch of stuff redacted, so I don't reveal what course it is and whatnot. So the process of making an exam is actually quite tricky for a professor because there are lots of different things that you're trying to test at the same time. You're not just trying to test the different content that you've taught, but also different types of critical thinking skills that are built into the course and things you've learned like actual math techniques. This particular course is a course on discrete math. So we cover things like combinatorics, number theory, and graph theory, an introduction to them. But then we also talk about proof techniques, like things like contradiction, induction, etc. And so I want to test an understanding of all of these things. I also want to make things accessible, too, so that students can start getting a feel that they can demonstrate the things that they've learned. So let's take a look at how I construct exams. So usually I like to start with a problem that's very similar to a homework problem. So here we have a problem that involves some kind of graph. And it consists of all n bit strings whose bits are from this set right over here. When n is 4, our graph G4 has strings like ABCA and AACA and ACBA. And then there's instructions on when things are adjacent. Two strings are adjacent if they differ exactly in one bit. Right? So for example, if you look at ABCA and AACA, they differ exactly in the second bit. So they're going to be adjacent in this graph, um, whereas these two are not adjacent at all because they differ in many positions. So the question is to determine the degree of every vertex and then to determine the size of the edge set. Now, the thing is, even if you don't have a familiarity with the concepts here, that's not the point. The point is, on an assignment, I ask a similar question uh, where this three element set is replaced with a two element set. So this first question is right off the bat a question that is sort of directly testing understanding of something that we did in homework. And I like to start right off the bat with something like that typically. Okay, this exam has eight problems and it's a take-home exam over a long period of time. So the problems will get progressively more difficult, but let's take a look. The second problem is similar to the one that we mentioned on the first one. So here, instead of generalizing something from an assignment, we do something from a, an actual class theorem. So we have this graph and we're given that every connected component is a tree. Okay, so there's something that we do in this class. Again, if you don't know graph theory, that's totally fine. But what it does is it relates the number of vertices and edges of a, this, these things called trees. And so now the point of this problem is to determine the number of what we call connected components when you are given a certain number of vertices and edges. So this tests sort of an understanding of that theorem about trees, uh, the result about trees, and then combining it with connected components. Again, something that people can just jump right into. Okay, I'm going to skip this problem here for a second and go to this next one. So this problem is a constructive problem that requires a direct argument. So the things that I'm testing here are, one, ability to construct a direct argument, and moreover, ability to work with definitions. So this problem, again, I don't need to get into the details of it, but it's a perfect example of actually looking at the constructs we built in the course and directly applying them to a problem. Okay, so this is a good place to jump in into under getting a sense if students are really understanding concrete things from the course. Now, as we move on in the exam, we want to test synthesis. So this problem here is an interesting one. You have a graph that looks like this. Again, if you don't understand graphs, that's not the point. And it asks you to prove that there's no way to draw this graph so that the edges don't cross, even if you decide to delete any three random edges. So you delete any three random edges, you still can't draw it in the plane with edges crossing. We had an actual relation in class that told us that if 
you violate that relation relating the number of vertices and edges in a graph, then it must be the case that your graph is not connected. So this is one of these examples of using this. However, there's some additional information here that the graph has this special property of being bipartite. And one of the things we did in class is we strengthened the inequality in specific cases. We didn't state that the inequality is strengthened when a graph is bipartite, but there's a consequence of having this property that falls into one of the cases. So this is an example of sort of linking ideas that seem a little bit separate, but are um, quite together. And there's a there are problems on assignments that are related to this type of thing. Okay, so so far on this exam, a lot of the work is either directly extended or related to something we did in class, or is something that was parallel to something done on a homework. So now, usually at this point, is when I like to test the concepts of understanding to get a sense of whether or not people have really understood particular topics. So here's an example of such a thing where I do something that somewhat combines graph theory and number theory. So here what we're doing is, and even if you don't understand graph theory again, the whole point here is to get a sense of what's actually going on. So what you do is you take the numbers mod p, and here we've chosen p so that it is one more than a multiple of four. Okay, so you construct vertices 0, 1, 2, up to p minus 1. Okay, and your constructed graph where two elements A and B are adjacent if and only if their difference is the square of a number, mod P. Okay, so one of the things we need to talk about is that if you have two vertices in a graph that are adjacent, then you can't have the relationship be one way and not the other, meaning A is adjacent to B, but B is not adjacent to A unless you're in a directed graph. None of our graphs were directed. So one of the things we talk about in the first part of the problem is in order for the adjacency criterion to make sense, it must be the case that if A minus B is a square mod P, that's the definition of our adjacency, then B minus A is as well. Um, and so we give an argument as to why this is the case. We say, suppose a minus b is a square. Then, directly translating, b minus a would be negative x squared. So if we can make negative 1 a square, then b minus a would be a square as well. And then it gives this blank statement that says, but negative 1 is a square mod p because, and then the students have to figure out why negative 1 is a square mod p. So this takes quite a bit of thought, and it relates to a little bit of things that we did in the actual course. Finally, there's this part that asks to prove every vertex in the graph has degree exactly this, meaning that if you fix a particular A, then the number of values B for which this congruence holds is exactly p minus 1 over 2. And again, this is not something that comes directly from stuff that we did in our class, but it really does extend ideas that give us a sense of how to go about doing these things. If you have a familiarity with Fermat's little theorem, that actually comes into play a little bit in this particular problem. So if you want to give it a try, go ahead. Okay, and the second last problem on this exam this is an example of something that I really, really, really like to do. So this is a problem that asks something about a condition on a set of graphs. It says you have degrees adding up to a certain number. Again, if you don't know what graphs are, that doesn't matter. And it asks you to prove that you can construct a certain type of graph called a tree with vertices dependent on the condition given. And it asks to give or it gives a hint to prove this using mathematical induction. Now, here's the thing with this problem. 
The reason I like asking it is it gives me a sense of individuals' understanding of how induction works. One of the things with this particular problem is it actually has issues with the way induction works where what people typically try to do is look at the end case and extend the graph. And one of the problems is that in doing so, you make an assumption that you can create all possible graphs in the family, these, this family particularly being trees, by starting with some vertex and growing out in any possible way. So there are some subtleties that appear in how adduction works on this particular problem, and that's one of the reasons I really like asking it. Another reason I really ask, like asking this problem is because the condition that was given, which is graph theoretic, has to do with a sequence of positive integers adding to a specific number. And one of the things that we talk about in this course is how to solve problems like this. How many positive integers would sum to this number on the right right over here? We actually do it for non-negative integers. So we can take this problem that was originally something graph theoretic and inductive and extend to a problem that has to do with counting, which is something that we talk about in the class. So a cool combination of things. Okay, and as a final problem on an exam, I really like to ask a question that I think of as a relative extension, but not necessarily something that requires a lot of leap, but requires some thinking about the pieces that are involved and really emulate stuff that we did in our class. So in this particular problem, I actually want to go through the details so you can try this on your own if you'd like to get a sense of what I mean. So let's say you have positive numbers v, k, and r with the v and k being sufficiently large. Take a set that has v elements in it. We're going to create a multi-set so A itself could have repetition, and each element of A is a K element subset of our parent set X. Now suppose we have this interesting condition among the multi-set of K element sets A. The condition is that every pair of elements in X is contained in exactly R of these K element subsets in A. I want to give a concrete example. So let's say V was seven. So our set X is the set of numbers from one to seven. And we're taking K to be three, so we're gonna list three element subsets. So here's a list of three element subsets of the set one through seven. You notice all of these things have three elements in them, and they all come from the set one through seven. Okay, we said A is a multi-set, so here is our entire collection A. And the statement that it's a multiset happens because we could have repetition. We have two elements, which are themselves three element sets, that are the same inside of this. Now, the condition here is that every pair of elements in X is contained in exactly R, a fixed number R of K element subsets in A. Okay, so in this example, every pair of elements in X one through seven, lies in exactly two of the subsets here. So, for example, if we look at the pair two, five, it only lies inside of two, five, seven, and two, four, five. Okay, so in this case, our R is two, and you can check for every pair of elements in X, they lie in exactly two of the sets in A. So if you have that condition, then the claim is you can actually determine how many sets there are in the, the collection A. And that is given by this formula in terms of R, V, and K. This is actually related to something in a mathematical area called combinatorial designs. Um, but the point here is this is a nice example of organizing information and understanding how to do combinatorial proofs. And so this is a question that I particularly like to ask. Finally, I like to do a little bit of um, testing of some of the basics through true and false questions, just getting a sense of people really understood the conditions of different theorems. So these are examples of some of these. And understanding the nuances of certain definitions. 
So that gives you a sense of how I like to do exams. A lot of professors have different ways of going about them, but I really think about these things quite deeply and it takes time to construct these things. So now you have at least a sense of one professor's perspective on how to make exams. And I find that this is a common idea or template for several professors that I actually know.